Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to another Real Conversation with the one and only from the great state of Texas, Daniel DiMartino Booth. Welcome back. Great to be here. Howdy. Yeah, you've been busy. Everybody wants to talk to you. you know, I, I, I can't imagine why. Uh, this, uh, my first question is going to be pretty simple, though. You know, has the Federal Reserve finally proven, in their own minds, if, if at all, that they can now bend smooth economic gravity and eliminate the business cycle? Well, let's see now. We've got stocks near all-time highs, so I would think that Jay Powell's running victory laps right now. Uh, so I, I actually do think that the Fed thinks that it's succeeding, and that level of delusion is really frightening. Yeah, the, 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 is it really that way when you're inside the Fed, like they're really backslapping each other, and it's like we're doing everything we can, we're, we're, we're heroes? Like, look, our models are working just like we planned, and I, it's like... <laughs> so we said we're going to buy junk bonds. Look, look what the reaction was. It's like, wow, you can't make this stuff up. And yes, uh, I think that right now there is probably um, some level of victory inside uh, the Eccles building. Makes no sense to me, Keith, again, because they've seen this show twice already. They saw it in uh, late 2018. They saw it last year when they had to come in and do not QE or whatever they fake, you know, fake QE, whatever it was. They've seen it twice before. And then they saw COVID prick the bubble that they inflated. And now they've had to come in and try and clean up the mess that it left behind. And they're, by the way, saying there was no bubble prior to this. This is purely a health event. Uh, but just, I really do think that they're succeeding. And that's scary. Well, and on those bubbles, I mean, I've started to call it just double bubble because we have the bubble of um, profitless companies that are just really cool ideas, uh, the Masasan type ideas where he calls himself the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then we have the other bubble, which is, of course, the corporate credit bubble, which is super late cycle. Um, so you're, they're still saying, and, and you're still saying that they're saying that there were no bubbles and they're not currently blowing bubbles right back up. No, because uh, last year the Federal Reserve came out and said uh, to lenders, you better not lend to leverage loan companies who are making up their EBITDA. <laughs> I mean, they call it standard versus actual. or, But basically, it's if they're making up their EBITDA by using add-ins, we, the Federal Reserve, you're on watch. You better not lend to them. They just bent Main Street lending, the, 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 the new Main Street facility, can now accommodate this garbage. I mean, they're actually breaking their own rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, Keith, you cannot make this stuff up. Yeah, no, I don't think you could. I mean, and it's quite got everybody hooked on it. I mean, the bubble, and, and somebody actually tweeted this, I think, um, right before we went live, saying, hey, so now we're going to suck all the retail investors into this one, just like we did in 2000. Then it's going to implode, like all bubbles. Well, first of all, uh, we've already seen phase one of the implosion, uh, and it's only two months uh, in the rearview mirror. But again, you know, the point that they made, or that this tweeter made, which is great, is that, oh, then you're just going to blame capitalism, and you're going to vote for socialism because nobody could have seen this coming. So you know, there's a certain irony here. Now, first, they were calling for socialism. Then, because we have implemented socialism, Bernie had to drop out of the race. And now we're giving millennials an extra $600 a week in unemployment insurance, and they've discovered day trading? <laughs> and what's the bubble pops? They're going to want socialism again? I mean, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see the like? I mean, you're you're you know yes, you're you're, 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 you're sorry, sorry, millennials. I know some of you are very, <laughs> but your your sense of humor is always one of your best traits. But I mean, it, there there's also you know there there's you go from angry to being sarcastic to being funny all at the same time. Like what what I see that actually on your Twitter stream. There are a lot of angry people. Uh, where do you fit on that on that anger spectrum? Have, let me tell you, I've been blocking the stupids. So <laughs> I have a no stupid policy anymore. It's, if you're stupid, you're gone. <laughs> All right. It really is getting crazy. I mean, you really do have the, like, everyone's, the it's like there's a, a certain uh, tweet line that they can come back to Danielle or I on Twitter saying, ha ha, you missed the bottom, Robin Hood. You know, it's like, you know, they're like, <laughs> it's just, I don't even know what to it's say anymore. It's indicative of an IQ. I mean, <laughs> seriously, people, the charts, I, look, I'm sorry, you're, you're friends with Liz Ann. I know Liz Ann. Liz Ann and I were born on the same exact day. Really? If she, if she's tweeting out Robin Hood charts as the head of Charles Schwab's 
strategy. Something has gone wrong in the state of Connecticut. Sorry. <laughs> Well, she's doing it from Florida, and we do have the Robin Hood trackers. They're actually great to trade against, and that's, that's why I'm sure she's, uh, she's laying that out. But it's an amazing thing to see the retail participation and then the hedge fund community join it together. I mean, as you know, the hedge fund community shouldn't be so proud of their returns looking back across the full investing cycle. Um, but again, let's just posit the idea that the economic cycle and gravity continues to exist. Um, let's just go to the wood on like that update on that today. Today we had... Uh, again, if you add up these PUA numbers, and some people are like, what's PUA? Um, you know, the, the pandemic, I guess it's the Pandemic uh, Unemployment Assistance Program. And that, with your traditional claims, you, you can get to a really big number, like 4.4 million already today. I mean, 1 million would be big, to be clear, but what did you think about that? Well, it's not so much the numbers anymore, because, I mean, we're, we're, we're over 40 we're over 40 million at this point. 28% of the U.S. workforce has applied for unemployment insurance. What I'm following more closely is the persistence. Right. So if we're nine weeks into this and we're still seeing initial claims coming in at these levels, then you are cutting into the bone at this point. This is not first wave. This is not leisure and hospitality. This is not restaurants. This is Victoria's Secret saying, uh, you know, we, 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 we got somebody who's, who's a normal weight. That didn't work. The pandemic hit. That didn't work. We're going to close 25% of our stores. That's permanent. Yep. Uh, so you're starting to see permanence permeate. Yep. And that's what you're seeing as we get this deep into this. And we have yet to see what is building, which is the white collar wave of layoffs. Mm -hmm. And we have yet to see, we're approaching June, but by the end of June, Paycheck Protection Program expires for the people who were the first recipients. So you'll have another wave beginning in July of people who are gonna fall off of that program and smaller businesses saying, you know what, I can't make this work. I've kept them on the payrolls for as long as I was legally obligated to do to have this loan forgiven. And now I have to reduce headcount or close. Yeah. Well, that, that's a real important point. Like, again, if you still do believe in business cycles, you know, that's the rank and file that gets fired first. And then, you know, it's, it's the old adage, you, when you know you're in recession, it's not when your neighbor gets fired or loses his house, it's when you do. And that's the white collar part. And that's the big ballast of the economy that I think most people may have not respected was so buoyant. You know, these bubbles didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, people, Masasan didn't invest in WeWork in six minutes, which is what he bragged about, um, you know, for nothing. Money was everywhere. And so were the jobs, the high paying jobs. WeWorks, yeah, office, commercial. We could spend the next 30 minutes talking about commercial real estate. We really, really, I mean, people don't, and, and, and they're the angriest people on my feed, by the way. Don't, don't, don't poke the real estate, mm -mm, nah. -uh. Because these are long cycles, they take a really long time to play out, the same as the fact with housing, and this, and I'm like, have you noticed we've had a little bit of time compression here? Just achieve it. So you can't rely on the old cyclical lag time, blah de blah de blah. This is not going to be pretty. Yeah, the permanence to it all it is what it is. Like you said, I mean, I can you take 35 million jobless to 40 million. That's like you said, it's in or around 23, 20, yeah, 28 percent of the of the whole shebang, and that's not even getting the thing started. The other thing on like you, you there's an acronym for everything. You got the PPP, you got the you, yeah, you know what and me. But you also have the cover your ass, the CYA that's coming. So public CFOs have to deal with reality in the second and the third quarter. And the only way they can get to the numbers now isn't by buying back stock. It's you know, reducing the share count. It's, it's actually by firing people. That, that part of the movie, uh, you don't get a hall pass on. Uh, is that something that, you, like, that just came out of my mouth that you would say is like, oh, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. That's the way it goes. Or that would actually, you know, God forbid, be, uh, be, be a contrarian statement at this point of where the markets are. Look, uh, CFOs have a process. First, they had to stop share buybacks. Uh, they had to batten down the hatches and they had to go, oh my gosh, we actually need our cash, unless we're an airline, in which case, anyways, let's not go there. Um, but first, they have to batten down the hatches. They quit share buybacks. Then they look at hiring plans. They go to all the departments and they say, you're not hiring anybody anymore. By the way, there's still 150,000 people coming into the US workforce every single month. 3.9 college graduates in 2019. They're coming soon into the workforce. You, you have to, I call it the silent wave, right. because there are laborers who are not being absorbed into the workforce as they normally would on a calendar basis. Um, but once you cut all the hiring out of your budget, 
and your budget still doesn't work, I need for you to look on your spreadsheet. It's a lot easier to do than it once was because we've got it all quantified because everybody's working from home. So now we can tell you it's FaceTime doesn't matter anymore. It has no value. Look on the spreadsheet. Tell me who your most productive and cheapest workers are at the same time. I want lowest salary, highest productivity. Right. You can keep them. Fire everybody else. Yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense. So how does that... Uh, what's the interplay there? Uh, there's going to be a series of questions on this, and, and we did get at least um, a, a sneak peek at, at what this debate will look like politically when you had Powell and you know the two that are now in bed together, Powell and Mnuchin, uh, again at the Banking Senate Committee earlier this week. I actually watched the whole thing, um, and, and I, I couldn't get it out of my head. Like, Powell, you got a dual mandate. One is full employment. That's the big show. Then you get the senator, I think it was from Kansas, who went off on the yellow roadway workers, where he said, hey, look, you know, we have like 30,000 of the, these or something like that. Uh, it's like junk, but it's really valuable to me politically. What do you think about these jobs? And, and Powell was kind of like a little bit of a deer in headlights on that. Uh, he was a deer in headlights in a lot of questions, and they were actually quite specific. But how do they get, does it matter? Does it even matter, the dual mandate? What, what is in the Federal Reserve Act or anything at all? It just means nothing anymore or what? Uh, well, the Federal Reserve Act doesn't mean anything anymore now that Enron accounting has been applied. So you've got your off-balance sheet accounting, your off-balance sheet vehicles, the Fed can buy anything it, wa it wants. I, I think what people, and this is actually tomorrow's, tomorrow's uh, Daily Feather, what people need to realize that Powell is doing, if they can't read the body language, He's had three major appearances in very short order, and he's begging, remember, he's Republican, he is begging stimulus legislation to be passed. He doesn't have enough paper to buy. He's had to pare back quantitative easing, and he doesn't want to do that. He wants to do more money printing, and he practically begged for it on 60 Minutes. He's imploring uh, more stimulus legislation to be passed and, and can't get enough traction because we're getting closer and closer to election day yeah. and the Republicans don't want to give the Democrats and the Democrats don't want to give the Republicans and this is just this is just general politics heading into November uh, but yet the Federal Reserve is stuck in the middle desperately wanting paper to buy well, I mean, but, but the interplay is amazing because you still had like Republicans were going to ask Powell the questions and Democrats are going to ask Mnuchin the questions and Mnuchin's trying to talk up the V and Powell's trying to talk down uh, some non-letter of the alphabet that's evidently clear to people. You know, it could be a side-swagging series of hack you up W's no, in no. my model, but it's definitely not no. a V. There's a term for that at the Fed. It's the not you. Remember we had not QE? Right. This is be the not you. It's gonna, it, the, the economy's coming back in the third and the fourth quarter. That's what Jay Powell said, but this thing's gonna be really long and protracted. So this is like not QE, but it's the not, the not you. The not you, I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. But at one point, it's, it's never made sense. At least this is the third go around for me. Um, and again, I'm just talking about the US um, version of what some very famous people on Wall Street now call beautiful innovation by the Federal Reserve, creativity, words like that, like almost like Masasan type shit. You know, like, um, but this is the third time that I've seen the Fed, both in 01 and in 08, basically run out of an ability to communicate that they can make the stock market go up because they couldn't make the business cycle change. And that's the part that we're going into. Like, how is that going to be wrong this time? Um, some people have, who've called you and I together part of the chorus, to be clear, we're part of a chorus. Um, they're like, you don't get it. They're fixing it. They're much more aggressive this time. Look. This is the quandary, and this is where the BS will stop. He wants to print more money because he wants to put it into the hands of the lowest third of income earners. And he wants to keep his facilities open that violate the Federal Reserve Act and buy junk bonds because he wants to keep Wall Street happy. <laughs> so he wants to keep the wealthiest happy, and he wants to print money to give to the lowest income earners in the economy. He cannot print jobs in the middle. Ah. And that is the problem. He can't print jobs, he can't print cash flow, and he can't print these small businesses back into business that the PPP has failed. And that is where he's gonna run into monetary policy failing to arrest the business cycle. It's taking a little bit longer this time because now he knows. He, he just looks at the playbook and he's like, oh look, I've got trillions of dollars to play with. Yep. So I'm immediately gonna do everything. Mm -hmm. Now he's begging Congress to be able to print more money because mm -hmm. he's run into a governor. 
Yeah, that, I mean, so that makes, and thanks for explaining it in Main Street speak. I think a lot of people really appreciate that about you in particular. Again, the Fe and that's basically summarizing what I was trying to get to, which is only three times in the last 20 years in my career, um, and fortuitously, I just stayed with the gravity. Yeah, I stayed with the gravity. The things that the Fed can't print. And, and, that's, and, and, and those jobs, I guess, and the cash flows are just it. Now, uh, I guess the answer from the buy side, those that own the paper that is, like you said, like on the high end, the Wall Street piece that's going to get marked, it's, isn't it actually just getting marked to model? If the cash flows keep going lower and people keep getting fired, isn't the Fed just doing what Lehman Brothers did, taking a, a series of shitty assets, quote unquote, uh, or liabilities or both, and mark them at a place that, 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 that is way away from gravity as time goes out? The Federal Reserve has replaced the credit rating agency. They're now the liars. That's the most succinct way that I can put it, Keith. Okay. They are, he, you know, to listen to Powell insist that there was no bubble coming into this. This is somebody who knows what the credit market is, knew what it was before, has friends in private equity. I mean, to, to suggest what he is, that this is not junk because like your parents used to say that used to irritate the hell out of you because I said so. It's not junk because I said so. As of <laughs> March the 22nd, I am getting rid of the, the law of gravity no longer applies. And I don't care if the credit rating agencies are going to call it junk because they have to, because they have to downgrade. The, but, but we're not going to call it junk. We, the Fed. So we have suspended reality because we're willing to buy it. But guess what? They can only buy these companies time. They cannot buy the business models into functioning. And that is why I, I sent a Twitter poll out weeks ago that said, can the, can the Fed, can Fed liquidity resolve insolvency? 79% said no, 21% said yes, 21% obviously owned this junk. And, but what, what the Fed can do and what the markets are rallying on right now is that the Fed can postpone insolvency. And that is what they're doing by suspending the law of gravity. Well, they can suspend insolvency of fund managers, but they can't suspend insolvency of, of corporates or individuals yep. for that matter. I mean, uh, that's the whole point. I mean, you, you, small businesses that have gone away are the ones that are most likely when we see it looking backwards, which will be years from now, we'll say, oh yeah, clearly they didn't get any liquidity anyway. And even if they got it, they'd be a more levered company within three months and they would have gone away faster then. You can't, solving for a, a, a insolvency with more and more debt is not an answer. Um, at least to me, but but again, I, I I don't know if you get this, but I get it. Like certain buy siders come back at me saying, "Ha ha, you don't get it. We traded it really well. We're on the other side." Oh, blow me! <laughs> that's you. That's what it is, right? I mean, it's just like. Um, Look, th 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 this is not a reflection of intelligence. It's a reflection of the Fed buying time, and the Fed buying investors' time. But it doesn't make you a genius. No. It just, just just doesn't. Well, the genius, I, th that's a, as you know, that's a thing that's bothered me for a long time. I mean, the genius is, um, again, the bubble went from the banks, tricky dick fold, to the buy side, okay? <laughs> the buy side owns the things now that are getting marked to model, whereas tricky dick and the bankers did it last time. But that, there was only a person, like I, I was at Carlisle when we quite literally, David Rubenstein said, you're going to take your marks. And from that point on, that was the end of the, of the credit side of hedge fund trading at Carlisle and for the Carlisle Capital, you know, whatever the hell it was called in London Fund. I mean, so there is a point where the gravity reach, reaches out to the mark to model prices of the market and says, you're coming down. Like yes. that, I think most people listening to that are like, tell me when, tell me when, as long as it's not tomorrow, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy whatever I'm gonna buy today in Robinhood. Like, it's like everybody kind of, isn't that, to me, that's part of the FOMO too. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but FOMO sure. is fear. Sure. And fear sure. is based on a reality that you believe in gravity, but you understand it can be suspended until it's not. And if that's right. T minus literally three hours of trading, you got to deal with that. But you can suspend the E all you want and, and you can just hang on to the P of the PE. You can do that. Uh, if you look at fact set data, revenues are still barely positive at the, at the end of this first quarter earning season what so you but again you can suspend the e you cannot do anything if top line revenue disappears there's nothing you can do about that as an investor zippo the fed can give you as much liquidity as you want if you're out of business you're out of business if you're not bringing in, if you're not generating revenue top line revenue you're gone 
So this, again, it's a postponement, but it's not a complete, it, 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 it won't arrest insolvency. It's just going to push it off. Hmm. And this takes us to the consumer. I mean, you have to bring the U.S. consumer and how the U.S. economy ticks into this equation. <clears throat> If you look at um, that, like, I don't know if you can see my slide, but on slide 107, guys, if you show um, cyclically adjusted earnings, I'm sure you, 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 if you, can you see this chart when we pop it up, Danielle? Can she see it or no? I can see it. Okay. I can see. Okay, so there's three big bubbles in there. There's one that ends in the 1920s. Again, in terms of like what you're willing to pay uh, on, a, on an earnings basis, and we're cyclically adjusting that, it's a Schiller model. Again, it's one way to look at it. It's my, it's my academic dogma if I have one little thing from that little place in New Haven where Schiller really pointed this out, is that you should, should at a bare minimum, cyclically adjust your earnings. Now, if you take out the mother of all bubbles when the S&P traded at 34 times earnings, never mind the cyclically adjusted peak, there's a twin peak between the late 1920s, entering the depression, and now entering a depression. Um, what, what do you see when you see that chart? Um. I see what you're talking about. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with Christopher Cole. I, I see a trend change coming, Keith. Like a, like, like a shift downwards is what I'm talking about. I mean, this, this is a very long time coming, and I think that we're going to have a change in valuation levels on, 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 on just a whole different plane. Well, there's one way to do there's one way to do that, which is just take down the P, right? The E is the E is the easy call. Actually, I've had certain, you know, there are a lot of co competitors to us out there obviously. Some people are making the call that earnings are going to rip. You know, the bottom is in after this quarter. They've been saying that for 3 quarters, of course. Don't forget that they said that earnings bottomed uh, ahead of the Trump, you know, truce or whatever, uh, the phase 1 of that, which was total bullshit. Um, but again, it's a, it's, it's a, we're eventually going to get to the other side. We got to trade today, but we're going to invest on 2022. I'll hear that a lot. I'm like, really, 2022? After all we've gone through, we're going to do that. Um, so there's one way: the P comes down in a calamity, like it just did uh, two months ago, uh, or the or we're wrong in the E. Look, I think I think you, I think it's both. I think it's the P exactly. and the E. <laughs> we got to a we got to ten. Intraday, we got to nine point something on the PE in the darkest days of 09. But we never did get to a sustained and prolonged single digit price to earnings ratio ever. And that is typically, I mean, that is what could make where we are today akin to 1933. And 1933 was as awesome as 2020 is. Uh -huh. But 1920, 1933 was also followed by the second fastest 30% decline in the broad markets. The first one being the one that started February the 19th. So we have to understand that if the top line revenue that I'm referring to does not manifest in the third and the fourth quarters, and, and now you're talking about the U.S. consumer coming back, not just coming back, roaring back pent up demand, I've saved too much, I'm gonna spend it all, I'm gonna buy a second home, I'm gonna fly around the world a few times, I'm gonna spend every dime I have and go into debt, mm -hmm. because there's a certain percentage of Americans who are completely out of work. So, but, you, but you're talking about the people who are still working in America, offsetting the spending that cannot be done by those who are out of work, who just have enough stimulus money from the government to play in Robin Hood and put groceries, sorry, to, to put food on the table, um, and, but, but you're talking about that offsetting the unemployed enough to generate that much consumption that you can reassume that top line growth level, that top line absolute dollar level. Not happening, Keith. I mean, the, the, so that's a great way to summarize. The P and the E ain't happening. They're, it's both. Um, now, take that to the behavioral wood, which is Wall Street. Okay, how does Wall Street feel right now? Number one, their, their shitty, like their, their, their house price, which has been going straight down in, in Fairfield, Connecticut, and basically any commuter city in New York since Wall Street started to lose their pricing power commissions, they're having a, 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 they're having a joyride. Everybody's home, all the houses yep. are getting sold because people are leaving New York, of course. All the trading commissions are going up, so what was a dead business is come back. Hey, we're gonna have a great quarter. 
the bankers, I talked to plenty of these uh, people all the time. Uh, I had one call with a, a person at Goldman the other day, and, and, and she's basically telling me, she's really bright, I'm trying to recruit her. And she's, she's like, I've never been busier. Our bonuses are gonna be huge because we're doing all these equity link deals. You know, and, so there's that. Secondary then there's, then there's a guy on the street. You know, the, the guy on the street's like, I just lost my job. You know, it's like, what the hell is going on here? There's, there's something to be, the, 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 the media has done a crappy job of covering what else Federal Reserve policy is doing. Yeah. I mean, you can look at a graph of loan loss provisions and say, holy shit, <laughs> that's a lot of loan losses that they're accounting <laughs> for. That's a lot. It's going to matter to the regional banks and it's going to matter yeah. in a big way. And that brings us back to commercial real estate, construction loans, et cetera, that are really going to bite for a lot of these small, mid sized lenders. But as far as the biggest lenders go, what the Fed is doing is trying to keep them in business. Yeah. Right. Look, you've got you've if you've got all these loan loss provisions, Jay Powell, you sure as hell better offset it with investment banking revenues and trading commissions. So let's oh I don't know issue a trillion dollars in in debt in in the space of five minutes because the Fed says it's going to buy junk. So you're 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 bolstering their investment banking fees. Secondary equity offerings are coming out 24 seven. Trading commissions are, as you just said, through the roof. So you're offsetting the damage done typically by these loan loss provisions. It's yeah. pretty incredible what the Fed is doing for the big guy as opposed to the little guy. Well, for a long time, I mean, and, and you've had, I've been critical in different ways, let's just say that uh, on Powell on this. I really don't, th I, I, I get that he's a lawyer. I get that he gets private equity. We worked at the same place. You know, I, I don't get that he knows how 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 he's being taken advantage of. I really don't. I, I don't think he. I, I think he he seems to be a nice enough guy. Like I think I can read people well enough to know that he's not the shark that Mnuchin looks like, um, or or Geithner for that for that matter, or Bernanke. I think that they're all far sketchier and, and we're more aware, put it that way, uh, of what Wall Street and and how they were going to get paid by Wall Street. I think that this guy is getting used and abused in a lot of different ways by the street. And, and you're gonna you're gonna see that history is not gonna look back uh, too fondly on that. Uh, I think you're right. I think he is a good person. Um, but if you're suggesting, uh, and I think I hear you clearly, and I would agree that he his naivete right now is very dangerous. Uh, you've got all these small businesses going out of business. You've got this quote unquote Main Street lending program that you take over 3,000 comments on, go back to the drawing board with other Fed officials and decide to increase the revenue cap to $5 billion and the number of employees to 15,000. And you can't tell me that that does not reek. A, Mnuchin's definitely there. His handprints are all over, his fingerprints are all over it. But that effectively allows these private equity firms to bail out their portfolio companies. That is what Main Street Lending Program became. That is the product of $3 billion on the record of, of lobbying by private equity firms in the first quarter on the Hill. They were trying to make sure that the companies that pay them dividends didn't have to go out of business. I think Powell thinks that he's keeping those employees employed, but what he's really doing is bailing out the big private equity guys so that they can continue to pay themselves one-time dividends, et cetera, load these companies up with debt, make them that much more dangerous to where when the, when the shit does hit the fan, excuse me, sorry, there is no chapter 11 route. They're just gonna have to liquidate. Yeah, you don't have to apologize for that. That's stating it exactly like it is. Um, uh, by the way, if you have questions for Danielle, pop them in the queue. There's up and down votes we have now, Danielle. So if you if somebody has a troll type question, they typically get voted down. So we have a new system. Uh, I think you'll like you'll appreciate that because you get trolled a little bit, uh, obviously too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Slide 128, guys, because this is kind of my summary on this discussion where the rubber meets the road. I think is is obviously during the election debate. I think we saw a preview to that. Uh, like I said, at the Senate Banking Committee hearings this week. Uh, so what I'm showing there is real simple chart. Uh, simple, maybe not emblazoned as macro awareness to all, but it should be. And we're trying to educate people here. So again, it's showing labor against capital. That's a pretty straightforward one. And we don't want to dumb it down too, too much. Um, but again, the black line is labor and the blue line are, is the people. Okay, so the blue line's been rising. It, it, it started rising a little late. 
And then they started like, you know, reluctantly paying some GM workers a little bit more. That's maybe metaphorically a way to think about it. Because they were in austerity, the people were, and the corporates continued to get paid. Levering up assets, haha, buy back stock, all that. Um, but it's, isn't it amazing, Danielle, that historically you don't have to make a really hard case to say that the black line is going to go to where it goes 100% of the time during a recession. So eventually the black line crosses the Rubicon, which is the people. And in this case, I'd argue that the blue line has much more political pressure to the upside than it's had in U.S. history. So I, I, I think that I, that's the ticking time bomb. I think that's the, if, if everybody's going to get money, it's going to be a political debate about who gets the money. And if the corporates don't get it incrementally like they've had already out of the shoot and the people get it, then the corporates are really screwed because they have to pay the people. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And th what... What, what I'm not so sure Republicans and Democrats realize is that the genie's been let out of the bottle. So uh, I, I, I was telling you before we came on, we, we came on live that I was on Oxford University, the Oxford Guild. I got more questions about modern monetary theory, about universal basic income. I mean, this train has absolutely left the station. For you to tell me that there's not gonna be, I mean, minimum wage is taking a step back from what we've seen legislated. So there's just, there's no way, it's like there's no way for, for the Fed to exit what they're entering. We saw that with the failed attempt at quantitative tightening and normalization of interest rates. It's gonna be very, very difficult to walk back what is happening on behalf of the US worker and yet, and yet this is gonna put a dagger into the heart of corporate profitability. What, it, what like is there any, um, again, this is a little bit more into the qualitative space, but again, uh, Trump's odds of, of winning have dropped um, pretty significantly, uh, certainly of the millennial cohort. That shouldn't surprise anyone given it's the first time they've been fired. Um, but again, and, and that really does matter. Do, did you lose your job or not? Do you like reelect the person that was in office? It doesn't matter if it's Trump or Pump or whatever. Um, you know, do you think that this, what do you think the odds are that Trump loses, first of all? And do you think that what's happened in the market um, in terms of its quote unquote rescue and it's all good now is a good or a bad thing for him? So the market rebounding is really good for him, especially if you understand how he got elected yeah. and people behind his election. Um, their, their bread has to be buttered. Yep. So um, I, I think if the stock market is to come down before his election, and I think that that's the top line reckoning that we're talking about, if that happens, and if there's not a V-shaped recovery, specifically in the labor market, I think that his chances of winning re-election are definitely um, falling and falling fast. Again, that's why he is saying that's why he's reopening, uh, you know, against the advice of some of his scientific advisors. He wants to get this economy back up and running in time for the election because there's one thing that will put the incumbent out of office historically if you go all the way back to 1900 and that is if there's been an, an appreciable increase in the unemployment rate in the year of the election right like that's a that's a i think it's a pretty straight up apolitical predictor and and, and that's what i was just trying to get get you to answer a question for people that they'll that they're normally going to have uh, but back on the um back on the on the blue line so let's just say let's let's say that you just were apolitical let's say there's a 50 percent chance trump loses now, um, the repudiation of tax reform or just turning it back, and you, know, you do have to have some tax dollars to pay for all this fiscal fund. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't that be the number one way to get the, back to the P versus the E? Get the, the, at least ensure that the E is screwed for a good long time. Uh, yes, I think, um, I, I think that higher taxes are a true reality. I mean, they are coming and they're coming fast. So, uh, and, and in many forms. They're, they're going to have all kinds of flavors. So um, I think that that is something that we have to contend with. I mean, it, I can't think of, I guess um, I, I can think of other ways. MMT theorists will say that that's entirely the way to go. Um, you know, I'm going to have to aside for two seconds, believe it or not, my laptop's about to die. Bear with me two seconds. To yeah. Keep talking about the blue and the, and the black line. Just two seconds. <laughs> the blue line and the black line. Let's go back to the blue line versus the black line. Actually, yeah, it's a really important one. I, 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 if, if you take away one thing from this, uh, and Danielle is so good. She knows that I, nobody can suck the oxygen out of a room better than I can on certain days and certain topics. But again, if you take away one slide from the 160 slides of pure, unadulterated data, there's no politician in this chart. You should take this 
Show it to your friends, ask them what they think. It's labor against capital. Quite literally, a sixth grader should be able to teach this to people. So I think that as a good American citizen and somebody who wants to be educated on the facts, that this is a really important one for you to be paying attention to. Was that good enough there, Daniel? That was great. See, you, you <laughs> gone on for 10 minutes. You're back, you're back. All right, let's go, uh, let's go to some questions. Uh, there, there's been a very long summertime in the profit cycle. There has been a very long time that corporates have, corporations have been able to, to live off the fat. And I think that those days, I think that the cycle, I do believe in long cycles, and I think that that era is coming to a close. Yeah, slide 91, guys, just so you know what a cycle is in months, okay? So this is the history of U.S. economic cycles in duration. We just had 129 months. You can say it in Canadian, you can say it in Texan, you could say it in any language you would like to say, 129 months is one hell of a long time. It's the longest time ever. Ever is also a long time. The prior one is, is 120 months. So again, the la we've only had two epic corporate bubbles, and, and I, I would summarily submit that that, Danielle, is just the point. That you live high off the hog when you don't have anything that changes. 120 months, you get an internet bubble. After 129 months, you get Masasan bubbles. You know, you get all the bubbles by the end of it if, if, you, if you just don't change the phase transition of the economy. But then once it changes, it all changes and changes for a long period of time. And what are the two shortest time frames between the initial inversion of the yield curve and the onset of recession? They're the two eras that you've just described because once you put that much leverage into the system, once that bubble's pricked, you'd have very, very little time in front of you because any little thing can blow up that level of leverage, which is to your point. Yeah, this is, um, so Danielle has this great line on Twitter. Uh, COVID-19 was the pin, not the balloon. What about that balloon? Is that just, is it, that's just the bubble. That's the mother of all bubbles. It includes all the bubbles inside the balloon, right? And, and, and again, the, the Fed, the Fed was releasing macro prudential regulations saying that these companies that they're bailing out we're going to be problematic and amplify financial instability. And now they're in denial of it. And you have to listen to Powell say that the economy was perfectly fine before any of this happened, and that there was no financial bubble heading into this. I, I mean, I, I, people were like emailing me Kleenex during 60 minutes. Oh, it's terrible. I mean, it's terrible. And it's a really sad thing that America's gotten to this point. I mean, having come here in the 90s, love free market capitalism. I just, I'd go down there red, white, and blue with you all the time. You know, it's just, it's just, but yeah, so I could take, I could take you, I can take Bianco, I can take, I had David Rosenberg earlier this week. I could take what I would say, take the top 10 voices of people who actually have audiences on this thing called YouTube and Twitter that actually have accurate opinions. And they, they, our voice, no wonder we're a chorus. We need to be put somewhere with the door closed and like a panic room where nobody can hear us. They need to listen to the, to the gnomes, you know, the weenie binners. The guys and gals that are going to get paid like 150 grand a year to just go, nah, 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 nah. like it's just like it's embarrassing. I think it's embarrassing for America. It makes us look like Europeans. Ooh, that was that was rough. <laughs> How do you know that this is not internationally televised? <laughs> European economists, not Europeans. I mean, you're you know European economists. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not Europe. That one, Keith. European econs. Yeah, I, thank you for making me clarify. I, I, I do have a central tendency to piss some people off. Uh, to the questions, the first one is that, that's got the most votes has to do with the dollar. Um, and you have thoughts on that. Obviously, the Fed's been trying their damnedest to devalue it, but it just doesn't seem to be working, does it? Well, it's pretty hard to devalue a dollar when all the other countries in the world are trying to devalue their currencies even more. And by the way, China's in the pisser. So it, it's, um, look, look, we have... The only rational thing, the only rational thing that Powell's done recently, and this has been in concert, unified front, all Fed officials are saying no to negative interest rates. So as long as, as other countries are going down that rabbit hole, and until there is inflation, there's going to inherently be the backstop of the dollar. It's just, it, all you're doing is eliminating other options. That's it. Do you, think, do you think that frustrates the Fed? You, I, I remember Bernanke, I'd count it every day, like when I started Hedge, I'm like, watch this. It was a magic trick. Every time Bernanke speaks or puts something in print, he will not mention US dollar. He didn't, mm -hmm. the, the whole time. You know, he, well, deva he devalued the dollar to a 40 year effing low and, and he didn't mention it once. 
you you are you are told on day one at the Federal Reserve, you're told that you are never, ever, ever, ever allowed to use the word dollar. Never. Like, That's a rule. You're not joking. That is a Treasury's purview. It is a rule at the Fed. You cannot talk about the dollar. That's it. Like you're serious. Yes, I, I am serious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I didn't, there's, I didn't. A lot of, there's a lot of compliance uh, training at the Fed. I did it for nine years. I'm pretty damn sure you're not allowed to mention the dollar. Wow. How about gold? That's another question. Obviously, it's question number two. I mean, what what would what would the Fed? What would uh, you know? How you, they have um, Powell seems to be watching market signals. Does he pay attention to that? Uh, no. I um, the one thing that was the 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 dollar was explicitly absent at the Fed and um, gold was like like the tooth fairy. It was just <laughs> disregarded. It was as if it was this, it, it, and, and we're talking about theoretical people here, models, but yet it, 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 it was nowhere to be seen, the whole idea of gold. And of course I'm working for the one cowboy who's not a PhD in economics who owns a lot of gold at the time. <laughs> uh, it's a matter of public record, I, I'm allowed to say that, uh, but no, gold was like Voldemort. It was never discussed. It was as if it didn't even exist. Do you do you think there's on that there's a question that's kind of like this? It's not the highest voted, but I wonder what you what you think. Do you think there's a hope in hell that the Fed ever goes back to the to the gold standard, or would would it, would advise to try something like that? Oh hell no. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you want me to elaborate? <laughs> no. The answer's no. Oh, I hear you. Okay, so there's upvotes and downvotes. This one's starting to get some downvotes. I don't know why. I guess we got some permabulls on the FOMO here. Uh, f only, oh. well, I should only five downvotes, 37 upvotes. Uh, what kind of move in equity indices is necessary for the Fed to openly ask for authority to buy stocks? Oh, I don't know. Maybe five percent. Five percent from here. Uh, it didn't take very much for them to come out with. I mean, it was like the first two or three bad jobless claim Thursdays were like, oh, look, it's 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard. There must be a Fed announcement coming out right now. And when do they put the financial stability report out that says that asset valuations might be a bit bubbly? At 4 p.m. last Friday afternoon at market close. I'm like, you, so again, you just can't make this up. You yeah. can't. So, so, I mean, like, do you, do you fully expect the Fed to be trying to buy stocks within two to three quarters or it could happen two to three days, I guess, if it's 5%. Look, there's a really easy answer to this. Before the Fed, no central bank on planet Earth was buying junk bonds. The Fed buying stocks is a step back on the risk spectrum. <laughs> if out on the risk spectrum, then stocks, get used to it, people, the Fed's going there. It's, it's just, it's a done deal. They're actually taking less risk than they are with this crap they're buying. You think they, they characterize that? We're gonna reduce our risk and we're gonna go uh, we're going to go over on this part of the capital stack and we're going to buy J&J, Procter & Gamble, you know, somebody who's got, you know, good balance sheet. We're just going to buy those stocks. Well, you know, BlackRock did say that equities are next and they're kind of running the show. So and I'm sorry, did I say that? Damn. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> what do you mean? By, uh, do you want me to ask a follow on to that? I mean, there's some things we're just not allowed to do. Um, uh, moving along, thoughts on the... Um, <laughs> I can't. No, 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 don't laugh. I tell and you, then, the, no. the NASDAQ 100, this is, a, this is actually an important fact that did happen. The NASDAQ, the NASDAQ 100, Danielle, declined 85% after Fed liquidity stopped driving the dot-com tech bubble in the late 90s. A very damaged economy on the other side seems like an easy call here. How Fed liquidity will play out this time in the pricing of publicly traded companies is hard to figure out. What do you expect? Well, I... Look, I think you have to talk, I think you have to go back to the valuation discussion that we were having. And if valuations are going to take a big step down, and uh, you know, we, we know with Silicon Valley layoffs that things are getting bad. Um, so I, I think that you have to look at future IPO valuations in the context of future valuations in general and understand that, that there's go if there's going to be a drought in earnings, and if we're going to have a protracted uh, decline in top line revenue, then by definition, you're going to have a weaker IPO uh, valuation cycle. I think that's reasonable. And even if I didn't, I think a lot of people would. 
Uh, did Danielle expect the Fed to go as far as they have gone already to stop the economic cycle? And what's the lesson from what actually happened? It's pretty early to be asking that, but. Um, I, I did expect for the Fed to do what they're doing. We did, uh, when I was still inside the Fed, we did debate uh, corporate bonds. We did debate municipal bonds. Both were decided against. So, um, but once you uh, open a dialogue at the Fed, that, that, that means that the, that the door is open for the future, which thank God Bernanke's not there anymore because he advocates for negative interest rates. But um, I, I was surprised at the rapidity. I was surprised at the, uh, at going to junk bonds before stocks. But again, you know, for anybody who's seen Keith and I chat before, there's, there, there is no danger like the danger of the credit markets. Mm -hmm. the, the, it, it, he went to, he put out the biggest fire. He put, he went to where the, the, the biggest chance of combustibility was, and that was um, the falling angels. Mm -hmm. And so he went to the biggest pressure point. Had it, had it needed to have been stocks, he would have gone there first. But he understands the credit markets, so he went there first. Yeah, and he went as fast as you could humanly, I mean, as I could have foreseen, um, impressively so, but now that's, that's done. That's where you're at. You've marked that to model. The cash flows are going the other way. Now the divergence continues to take hold. And time and space, as our friend Einstein would say, will beat you Newtonians and your assumptions along the way. Um, right. So, continues to say that the Fed can do more, but what he's really saying is that the Fed can buy stocks and or the Fed can do more QE. That's what Powell's language translates into. Yeah. Um, so you can have like 60 million unemployed, and if they're buying stocks, people think that, oh, you just buy stocks. I mean, that, that, there's an, a unique interest. Uh, uh, first, let's just start with the point that for the Fed to buy stocks or see a calamity, you got to have your calamity first. So if you think that stocks never go down and you still want that, you still have to have one thing comes before that. So I always try to remind our friends. Yeah, that you need it too. You can't. There has to be something that prompts the Fed to come out um, and, and it, it, the, even the Fed has shown that there's a little bit of a limit. No, you're going to have to have a pullback in stocks for the Fed to buy stocks. Right, exactly. Okay, now here's a, here. this question's moving up. It's moving up in the upvotes, and this is eventually going to be always the question because this is kind of the, like you said, it's a summary point of bulls. Uh, um, Keith, can you and Danielle talk about Fed liquidity and MMT? Uh, curious to see if, you're, if, if you think the rally will never end unless the Fed removes themselves from the market. Never. No, because I don't think the never part applies to the top line argument that I'm putting out there. Again, the Fed can do a lot. The Fed can offset a lack of profitability. And we've seen that. We've seen that. Um, but the Fed cannot offset a lack of cash flow. If there's no cash flow, you can throw liquidity at a company. But if, 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 if a company does not have cash coming in the door and, and top line revenue, then it is not a, no longer a going concern. So it's it's like um, I don't know how do you like is, is is that just your general answer for that question because it's like can you never stop going up I mean that's clearly uh, FOMO at at its pinnacle but I mean you know, people really have gotten paid only from certain points to believe that now you'll your 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 average or your kind of like prolific tr Twitter troll wouldn't have said anything about where it stopped going up the 35 percent decline and any of the money lost there it's just that they all bought the bottom because you got you can't fight the Fed right there at the bottom. Yes, that is the case. But again, not fighting the Fed in the context of a recovery or prospects for a recovery. If you're talking about long-term unemployment, then that has to factor into the narrative and that has never worked. So it's one thing to slow the business cycle. It's one thing to be lower for, for, for you know, for even longer, but you, you, the, I'm going to go back to my, 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 apparently my new hashtag. You, know, you can't print jobs. You can't do it. And there's only so much that the Fed can do without congression, without Congress stepping in. And I think that that's why Powell has been so adamant saying the fiscal authorities have to do more because even Powell, I, I hate to break it to you bulls, but even Powell is realizing the limits of Fed um, of, of, of the Fed's monetary efficacy right now because they don't have anything to print for. Mm -hmm. So if Powell's seeing the limits, how are the bulls not? 
Well, it's, it's amazing to watch because you've, you've, you've obviously been able to watch the movie, uh, the preview and the prequels and everything fully loaded in Japan and Europe. So, um, you know, Japan's got uh, negative rates. Europe's got negative rates. You know, the whole right. concept that don't fight, like, why don't they have that damn, that stupid saying, don't fight the Fed? I like to front run the Fed. I think that that's eminently doable. Um, sure. You know, that's I, how people start it. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, I bought treasuries a year and a half before the Fed decided to buy them. You know, it's, right. The economy is not just the corporations that that populate the stock market. There are also other other sectors like commercial real estate that have not quite kicked in yet in right. terms of damage that's going to be done. And, and again, there's and that's why you've got you know people in commercial real estate on Bloomberg and writing long op eds saying, boy, do we need a bailout? There's only going to be so much that that can be done. Yeah, commercial and industrial loan cycle is a disaster. Slide 74 guys on the deck. You can see if this is anything remotely close to 0102, where the drawdown in GDP, you could barely see it back then, to be clear, but the leverage on the corporate side was very high. This is the whole point, is that there's a workout period. You can't just you know continue to get more and more and more and more leverage. I mean, go ask the WeWork guys about that. Um, so again, we're in phase like first inning on this when it comes to that part of the credit cycle. It's very clear to anybody who studied it. I think that, I, I guess, Danielle, I guess the point would be, take your slides and shove them up your ass, Keith. We're gonna take advantage of all the dumbasses out there that don't know anything about what you and Danielle are talking about. Uh, yes, they're the millennials at home day trading. I think that should be a new sitcom. Yeah. Millennials at home day trading. <laughs> That's great. Um, here's one. Uh, well, actually, this is the point on negative real rates. This is moving up in the in the Q2. When will negative real rates come to the U.S.? And I think people do also say, well, the Fed said we can't have those in their latest minutes. But does that mean that you can't have negative interest rates? No, absolutely not. That's determined by the market. And that's why we had a money market fund go break the buck a few days ago. So, uh, you know, the devastating effects of negative interest rates can still be felt, even if the Fed holds the line on the Fed funds rate. So there, there's only so much you can control in terms of the market pricing. Well, if you if you look at the like people can identifiably tell you like if you have even even if I've set up a, a, a Roth account for my new dog, Boomer, he's only nine months old. So I'm going to buy him some stocks that are really contrarian. I'm going to buy some Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google. You know, so if you take that part of the market and you just put it in even your dog's account, uh, which at this point, there's no alpha in that. It's just everybody owns it. It's all beta now. Um, if you look at the financials, they're down 30% from where they were. That's called the stock market crash and ongoing bear market. What happens to the banks, to their fundamentals and to the bank stocks if interest rates go negative? Not a whole lot. Um, it's toxic. It's, it's actually, it's, it's, it, is, it is nuclear for banks to try and, and, and generate any kind of a profit in that environment outside of the trading environment. So, but as far as actual underlying bank profitability, that is that is just it is, it is the worst thing. It's poisonous. Yeah, it's awful. Um, and there, here's here's a question that that I had. Um, we're, we've gone through a pretty good chunk of them here in the queue. But um, you made this point about you know, uh, this is I think this was a tweet. Uh, political zombification of our economy steer, steals your wealth, your job, and your kids' future. What do you mean by all that? Look. Clearing, I mean, people are like, oh, those damn bears. They always they always talk about Schumter and creative destruction. And look, this, at last check, this is the United States of America. You've got to get the crappy operators out so that you can have efficient innovators come in and create jobs for the next generation of workers. If you're going to insist on zombifying the economy, then you are going to paralyze future growth prospects for your children and for their children, for that matter. So this, this is something that absolutely has to be done for the health of the economy. So when you talk about, about a, a third, Facebook put a, a survey out a few days ago that a third of small businesses in America say that they're not going to be reopening after the economy reopens, depending on where they are geographically in the country. When you take that out from underneath, the, the, the backbone of the economy literally collapses because you're killing your next generation of innovators and and keeping the the, the negativity and the dead wood and the zombies up and running and, and operational there's there's nothing worse that you can do to to crucify future federal uh, f future economic growth nothing that, that's awful. I mean, I, I, that's not the America that, that I came to. It's certainly not the one that people envision. A lot of people uh, are still left. Uh, what I've come to learn whenever I say that there are a small minority of us that still believe in free market capitalism, people are like, ah, yeah, I'm that, here. That, 
that guy Chomet on the West Coast with the yeah. whole CNBC interview that went viral. Honestly, I've got like a picture of him on my ceiling. He's my total hero. He's like, we have a bankruptcy code in this country for a reason. Unsecured debtors get wiped out. Shareholders get wiped out. Employees don't necessarily get fired if you go through Chapter 11. I mean, for God's sake, that's American. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's disgusting to see it going away. Now, in the meantime, like what I've been doing, and, and uh, maybe a, a good question to wrap up on this, because I'm going to uh, ask you a question about something that you've summarily concluded is, is a way to think about this in the future state. I, I mean, being long and anti-fragile business models or, or business models that have the ability to, to adapt on the fly here, change to behavioral realities and consumption behaviors, you know, I'm, you and I are fortunate to have those. We, we own those. We're, we're blessed, but we worked hard to do that. That is the capitalism that we're talking about. We're proud of it. Um, but you also talked about a, um, a new frugality. Uh, and, and that's something that when I read it from you, a new frugality, I was feeling all Benjamin Franklin about it. You know, can you expound upon that? So um, thrift has been something that has existed in the American culture in theory only. Uh, the, the silent generation uh, that, that lived through the Great Depression, they're only 7% of Americans. So there are very few people alive who value thrift. Uh, but 38% of Americans who made $100,000 or more had not a penny in savings. Uh, I, I'm talking about the middle of the country, not, not the people getting an extra $600 in unemployment insurance and, and, and they're, they're, they're fine. They're, 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 and they're going to be fine. And then unemployment benefits are going to be extended. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the people in the middle who were woefully unprepared for what happened and who have never had to look at their families and, and say, oh my gosh, I should have saved. I should have saved. We're suffering because I, I, I didn't really need this $800 car payment, but I could afford it, so I got it. And we didn't really need too much house, but you know, we, we could we, we, we could make the payment, so we got it. But there, several generations of Americans have never known suffering or shame. And the impact that this is going to have on how people approach money and how people approach spending, I think, is going to be changed for a generation. I think people are, it, it's no longer theoretical that your parents say you should always save for a rainy day. It's not some cliche because people have actually lived through it now and they know it, it's it show don't tell. You've shown so many Americans that they absolutely have to save for a rainy day. So I think that the way that we approach consumption is going to be fundamentally altered for a good number of Americans. I mean, you have to go way back, obviously. I mean, it, it harkens back to the other side of it, but we've touched a lot on this, is the people that are getting paid by this is, is a little bit like the late 1920s with the Great Gatsby. You know, there are, there are certain few that can behave not that way. And, oh, then, cool. and then there's a certain divide that gets created because of behaving that way. Is that what you meant by shame? Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and but you're bringing up a whole different aspect, Keith. And that is that there is there is going to be something, you know, I'm 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 good friends um, uh, with a guy out in 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 Connecticut, Ben Hunt, and he's done a lot of fundraising yep. for PPE and what have you. Uh, but his hashtag is our finest hour, and I think that we've seen some incredibly wonderful acts of courage and 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 giving in this country. And when, but when we have these moments, when we have these shots, when we have these once a century cultural shifts, if you're gonna be the guy out there who is conspicuously consuming on the other side of this, uh, you're pretty much a sociopath. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean to be calling people out who've worked hard and gotten everything, I'm just talking about excess. Excess is going to be frowned upon going forward because there are going to be so many people in need. And again, that is going to be a separate reflection of a cultural shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had, uh, I've had, I was fortunate enough to actually to have, I think it was on your recommendation, Ben Hunt, um, I think it was uh, last week or the week before that. It's really Groundhog Day for me in here. <laughs> and, yeah, he's a total Connecticut guy. Yeah, and he is, uh, he, he was really, I mean, to me, that's the way I've always tried to live my life. I'm not trying to tell people how to live their lives, but I mean, you know, be humble about what you have and when you have it, and, and particularly in your neighborhoods now. I mean, there's, do you really go up to only the neighbors that have, uh, that are killing it, crushing it, trading it on Wall Street? Like, come on, that's, that's not, 
that's not who I want to be. I don't think that that's uh, obviously who you are either. And no, I, that's what community is all about. Yeah, and it's, I, I think it's, I mean, that, that could be, you could have frugality, you have community, you have family. There's so many positive things coming out of this. But in between all that, I don't want people to get in, you know, out of their risk management shoes. Because if they were in February, they, they were woken up to a new reality associated with that. And, and I, I guess the summary of what we're saying is, you know, get ready for part two. And uh, unless yep. you disagree, maybe that's, a, <laughs> maybe that's a good way to end it. Nope, I think that's, that, that, that's the best way to end it. You can fudge the E, you cannot fudge the top line. No fudging from Danielle DiMartino Booth. You crushed it again. Thank you so much for uh, spending the time, and you're so gracious to do so. Thank you, Keith. Be safe. Take care. Yeah, you too. She's Daniel DiMartino Booth, outspoken, and she's real. Thanks for paying attention to us. We uh, certainly enjoyed having you as our audience.